Good afternoon. This is Parsha Talk. I'm Avi Grossman. Thank you for joining us. Uh, today, uh, we are going to continue discussing this week's Parsha, Parsha for A. Uh, Parsha, and I particularly enjoy uh, a Parsha that, for those of you in the diaspora, are very familiar with the conclusion uh, thereof. Uh, the last Aliyah of the Parsha is read on all the additional days of Yom Tov, Yom Tov Sheni Shal Goyoth, the second day of Yom Tov that is, that is observed in the, the diaspora. Uh, for example, uh, the Parsha is known as Kol HaBachor. Uh, it is read on Shmini Asereth. Here in the land of Israel, there's but one day of Shmini Asereth, and it's, that's when they celebrate Simchat Torah, uh, the conclusion of the reading of the Torah, so they read the end of the Torah on that day. Uh, in the diaspora, they have the first day of Yom Tov, and they don't, for whatever reason, finish reading the, the Torah cycle on the first day. They wait for the second. So on, on Shemini Atzeret, they read Kol Bechor. And uh, also because of Shemini Atzeret, they add a little bit to that. They start uh, two readings earlier at Aser Taser. So too, on the eighth day of Passover, which doesn't exist here in the land of Israel, uh, Kol Bechor is read once again. And on the second day of Shavuot, which, uh, of course, Shavuot is just a one-day holiday here in the land of Israel, so it's uh, in the diaspora they read it then or also. And, uh, of course, when either of those days, the last day of Passover or the second day of Shavuot, happens to be on the Sabbath, the longer reading we add, just like we do on Shemiyat Sarath, we read Aser Taser also. So uh, this parsha is one that many become familiar with because they hear it so often, uh, although I kind of miss it. It's been a decade since, and uh, what are you going to do? It's just one of those things that if you're keeping the halacha as it should be, keeping Jewish law and observing the, these uh, holidays as one day as they're supposed to, you miss out on certain things. You also miss out on additional eating, but then again, uh, it says in the Jerusalem Talmud that perhaps the, the reason for this is that in the, land of Israel, in the land of Israel, you're close to God, so whatever spiritual nourishment you get for having one festival day is good enough, but in the diaspora, you don't get enough, so you need a second dose, perhaps. Uh, let's get into some of the issues brought up earlier in the parsha. First is something called Shehote uh, Hos, sacrificing outside of the temple. Uh, we mentioned this before. It is strictly forbidden for a Jewish person, at least, to offer sacrifice anywhere outside of the place that God shall choose, which we discussed last time. Uh, what that meant in history was wherever the central altar was, when the tabernacle or the mikdash fully stood. Since Solomon's time, there hasn't been an exception to this. The temple was uh, built in Jerusalem, and it is to remain there forever. And even uh, halacha, even though it is not there, it's currently in a state of destruction, it still counts as though it's there. And so too with the altar, and therefore, technically speaking, we could still offer sacrifice today. If we would have a priesthood and uh, proper permission and the right animals and people keeping these laws, and of course, the, it's the government's responsibility to see to it that a temple actually be built, that the altar be put back in its place, God willing, soon. Uh, there used to be. We also mentioned a prohibition of sacrificing anywhere beyond the tabernacle when they were in the desert. Uh, so they were they are ritually slaughtering. Sorry about that. They were forbidden to never ritually slaughter anything. Uh, it had to become a sacrifice. And Moses is telling them that once there is a central temple, uh, the Jewish people would be allowed to ritually slaughter anything, as long as it's not a sacrifice. It's what we call hulin, uh, uh, desecrated meat or non-holy meat, uh, ordinary meat. And that's what we have today. We slaughter the animal. We use a ritual slaughter that's uh, precisely prescribed in the books of halacha, uh, it's part of the oral tradition, but by no means can we say it's sacrificial, it's for strictly forbidden to do that. We also have the prohibition of eating any blood, and this is something that ex has existed well earlier than biblical times, that Jewish people did not eat any blood whatsoever. Certain animals have blood that is thrown on the altar, that's uh, the, the two uh, species of uh, there's uh, uh, bovine, uh, two species of bird, uh, turtle doves and pigeons, and three species of animal, uh, goats, uh, bovine, and uh, sheep. And everything else is technically kosher. There's a special uh, commandment, of course, that if you have a wild kosher animal, I think giraffes, gazelles, deer, etc., or any uh, fowl that is slaughtered, uh, and this is except in the temple, uh, the two birds slaughtered in the 
couple, they didn't have to do this, they'd have to cover the blood. Your blood is supposed to be caught on the ground or in a bucket full of dirt, whatever it is, and then it has to be covered with something else, something that is dirt-like, dirt, dust. They say you could use sawdust, uh, you could use uh, straw, etc. something that if you would leave it sitting and then put water on it, it would cause something to grow out of it. You couldn't use, let's say, plastic shavings or iron shavings, but there's plenty of other things you could use. And indeed, that, that's what they do do. Uh, some people, they, uh, they see a chicken slaughtered every now and then. They're, they have the opportunity to see that, so they want to hop around and take this mitzvah. They uh, slaughter the... Okay, thank you for the likes. They, they slaughter the chicken, they, they cover the blood. So this is for wild animals and for chickens. Uh, in the temple, of course, the blood of the animals was put uh, expressly on the altar. That was the, the main part of any uh, sacrifice. Now, Jewish people have always been told not to drink blood. Uh, they're not allowed to use it in any way. And first of all, when an animal, of course, slaughtered, a lot of blood comes out. If it's a sacrificial animal, that blood is put directly on the altar. For any animal for consumption, not only is all the blood that comes out washed off, they also have a, we have a commandment to physically remove all the rest of the blood through roasting or through uh, heavy salting. And by I mean salting that is beyond why I say healthy salting because as ways described in the halacha books, it's a salting that would you wouldn't salt your steak that way. It would be too salty to eat in that state unless you would wash off the salt. Indeed, that's what we do. We first rinse the meat, we soak the meat in order to soften it, and then we salt it uh, and let it sit in the salt, either hanging somewhere or in a perforated vessel, so that all the blood can run off. This is highly ironic because in many other cultures, uh, at least in meat eating cultures, blood. Is, uh, is either just ignored, they don't try to get rid of the blood. Let's say in America, there's no act of salting or any attempt to remove extra blood that comes out from the slaughter. And in some places, like in Europe and in China, uh, blood is actually a delicacy and is used in recipes and things like that. It is very ironic that at certain points in Jewish history, the Jewish people, who were the ones who gave this to mankind in history, the idea that blood should never be eaten uh, were accused of eating blood or even trying to murder children or other people in order to obtain their blood for consumption, or as it was said, for the production of uh, matzot on Pesach. Uh, nothing could be further from the truth, of course, but again, for anti-Semites, nothing ever stopped them. You know, whatever you can accuse the Jews of, but this is very clear. Jewish people have never eaten blood. It's considered something uh, highly repulsive, not repulsive in that we think it could start disgusting, but from a ritual standpoint, Jewish people do not do this because it's a very strong commandment of the Torah. Uh, moving along, uh, we also have this idea of, uh, <clears throat> of uh, idolatry and the temptation to it. This is a kind of a strange departure um, from the earlier parts of the parsha. We have this prohibition of uh, sacrificing in certain ways, slaughtering in certain ways, and eating the blood, and soon we're going to have a list of, also, once more, it's slightly divergent from the list in Leviticus, a list of the kosher animals and uh, the kosher birds. Sorry, not a list. It says kosher, non-kosher birds, and the ways to identify uh, kosher animals, kosher and kosher fish. So for kosher animals, it first says uh, they have signs, they chew their cud, and they have split hooves. And it gives examples of animals that have either or, but not both, you know, the... Uh, like Slifkin says, the camel, the hare, and the hyrax, whatever those three animals are, uh, exhibit one sign. And the pig famously has split hooves, but does not chew its cud. Those are all considered unclean animals. And every other animal that would have this, whether domesticated or beast, a chaya or a behemoth, uh, that has these, uh, uh, these attributes is technically kosher. You don't need a, a specific tradition that such an animal uh, is kosher. It, if it has the signs, it's okay. And same thing with regards to anything in the water. That's what it says. Anything in the water, check. Everything in the water is basically considered a fish. Check if it has, uh, if it has fins and, um, and scales. So there are many fish that you could tell. They don't have noticeable fins. Maybe they could find a fin there. But it has to have, uh, or it doesn't have scales. It can't have a smooth skin like a catfish has fins, but certainly no scales. And uh, a sea uh, horse, uh, I think that's what they call them, um, uh, starfish or crabs and crustaceans, anything. They're obviously not possessed of fins 
or scales, so all those are non-kosher. The birds are complicated. This became an issue again recently. Uh, there's just a list of non-kosher birds. And the, although the sages uh, gave us signs of what the kosher birds are like, for example, they're not predatory, and you can see something with their, the way their hands are, are formed. By hands, I mean the, 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 the appendages on which they walk, not, not their wings. So you, you'll be able to see this, but these are not biblical signs. They're not described in the Torah. Rather, it's just a list of animals not to eat. So they used to know what those animals were, and basically if it was on the list, it's kosher. And later generations, that list became a little bit more obscure. Basically, when you, ever, when you ever have a list like this in the Bible, lots of different species of animal, or flora or fauna, there is uh, there has been uh, controversy since medieval times what they are. So the list is shrinking, and basically, because of uh, the practicality of the matter, we just only eat the birds, of which we have a positive tradition. And the turkey got grandfathered in, because when they discovered the turkey, uh, they assume, well, it's not on the prohibited list, so they start eating it, and then eventually the practice became, we're only going to eat those things that we know are positively kosher. So the turkey got in there, but there were, even uh, in certain times, places, and there's still families like this, where they took upon themselves not to eat turkey. Uh, the rest of us do eat turkey. We kind of like it. The standard practice is to eat turkey, and they're even, even on Thanksgiving, the day you're supposed to eat turkey, uh, and that's how it got in there. But before we discuss the kashrut, there's a, a break in the text where it discusses three things that could bring us off the derek. The first one we mentioned last week um, was a false prophet. We, we were told, don't try to learn how they, uh, those nations, worship their gods. And then you could have a false prophet who will try to entice people, uh, tell them, let's go worship another god. By the way, what are the signs of a false prophet? He prophesies in anything but God's name. Uh, that means you know, he says that he's sent by something else that's not God. Or he predicts the future. He says this is going to happen, and then it doesn't happen. Or he tells us to violate the Torah uh, per on a permanent basis. Uh, we said that before that there's a, a way for a prophet like Elijah to come and say, I'm going to, or you should do a one-time prohibition. But to say that everything is now taken, this prohibition no longer applies, or a new commandment, that's how you know you're dealing with a false prophet. So first you have this false prophet that is trying to tempt people into idolatry. God says the reason why he allows false prophets to exist, or even to allow false prophets to do magic tricks, they can make a saying that looks miraculous, uh, and therefore we should believe him. God is testing us. And indeed, uh, history records that there are people who believe that certain people uh, were able to perform miracles, and that's how they could convince people to believe them. We do not believe in Moses because he pr uh, created miracles, nor do we believe in any other of the prophets. They predicted the future. That's the way to do it. And then once they have their uh, certificate of authenticity, or they, some other prophet was already established as someone uh, who can be relied upon, uh, vouched for them. But prophets don't do miracles. What's the problem with a miracle? It could just be sleight of hand. It could be a trick that we don't know about. It could be a science trick that he was aware of, that we were not aware of. We don't trust those things, and we certainly don't listen to these false prophets. Uh, a well-known atheist uh, pundit, who was not exactly a big fan of Judaism or Jews or Zionism for that matter, uh, at least said it's to the Jews' credit that when the most famous false prophets of modern history, uh, oh, of, of human history, showed up, uh, namely the founder of the Christian religion and the, and the founder of the Muslim religion, showed up, it was the Jews who first sniffed them out and rejected them. The Jewish people have been rejecting prophets for thousands of years. We, we are hoping to see prophets, but it's, it happens to have been for now for two and a half thousand years, and perhaps more so. We have not produced a prophet, and for good reason. We don't trust them. They, 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 we have a very high standard, and we will not be fooled, and we will be, uh, we'll remain loyal to God. They then have the idea of a Mesit. The Mesit is someone, it says, who tries to, he doesn't use his prophecy powers, he says he could be your brother, the brother or son of your mother, or your son or even your daughter, even your wife or your friend, and he says to you in secret, let's go worship some other, uh, some other gods. So you're not allowed to listen to them, and not only that, he is to get the death penalty, and it says you're not allowed to have compassion for him. That is, uh, the sages interpret this to mean that sometimes you could even entrap him. If you if you really think he's trying to do this, you can set it up that you'll have witnesses listening and uh, use other uh, methods in order to make sure that he really said what he did. 
And you have to make sure to give this fellow the death penalty also. He's a, he's a real big troublemaker. Of course, we don't institute the death penalty anymore for people like this. And even the sages' time, this is something that they were uh, tried to avoid doing. Uh, thank God in history you don't have so many of these, but they have existed. There are people like that, and uh, they're also considered as big a threat as a false prophet. Uh, sometimes you have a Jewish person, there's been a few times in history, a Jewish person called a Mishumad. That's someone who uh, adopts a foreign religion and then tries to persecute the Jews, try to get them to come along with him, and if not, the penalty of death. There's been famous people like that throughout history. And then they have something called an Irhani Dahat. Unlike the other two examples, the false prophets, which we know of many, there are many recorded in the Bible and post biblical times, and Misitim, people, Jewish people, Jewish born people try to get Jews to uh, abandon the religion, we have something called a wayward city. And a wayward city is one where that is uh, after due process, it has been determined that a majority of its inhabitants have been found guilty of worshiping idols. Now, the penalty for worshiping idols is one thing. But for the majority city, the city where the majority of the inhabitants are convicted, the penalty is entirely different. I believe that for someone who worshipped idols, the penalty is stoning. But for all these people, they're killed by the sword, and their city is destroyed. Some uh, are aware of uh, an opinion in the Gemara that says that a lulav, uh, a palm frond, taken from such a city, when after it had been convicted and sentenced to destruction, palm frond, which is supposed to be used in a ceremoniously, uh, ceremonially in uh, on Sukkot. So such a palm frond is as though it doesn't exist. It doesn't have the minimum length for the mitzvah because it, it's already supposed to be burned. Uh, Maimonides did not hold that way. He said that it's, if it's taken from such a city, it's a, it's a commandment, a mitzvah that comes from uh, a sin. And mitzvahs cannot be performed that way. He didn't hold it that way, but people are aware of this. Uh, children learn this first idea that uh, a Palm frond taken from such a city has to be destroyed. It has no measurement because it, like, it doesn't exist. So we have this commandment, and uh, um, in the Talmud there's an opinion that says that this never actually happened. There was never such a city that the majority of its inhabitants had been convicted of idolatry, and therefore the city was sentenced to destruction. They actually carried out such a thing. Uh, this and the idea that there would never be a wayward son of a very specific age a child who will discuss this when the time comes, who is put to death at a young age because of what he will grow up to be. He is a glutton and a drunkard, and we assume that he'll grow up to be a, a menace to society, you know, an even bigger menace to society if he grow up, so he is put to death then. So there is a, an opinion, which seems to be the, the majority opinion, that this never happened, no, it never would happen. And there is an opinion that says, uh, no, such a thing that happens the same uh, source who says that he did see the grave of a wayward son put to death, and he saw the mound that remained of the city that had been destroyed in this manner. Why did the sages feel that this never would happen if the other two do happen? It, it could never happen, they have a wayward city. Yeah, perhaps it's the Jewish people's credit that this never did happen. Uh, the rest of the sages said that this uh, section exists if only so that the Jewish people could study this and uh, obtain reward, whatever that means. We'll discuss one time later what it means, the reward for studying the Torah. Uh, I personally like the Maimonidean explanation. But that is what we have for Irani Dahat. And also, uh, we don't have, we have evidence of cities being destroyed in wars. This is what they used to do in ancient times, if they would raise a city and burn it down. But they would no normally keep the spoils. Uh, according to this commandment, even all the spoils of the city are to be destroyed. Very interesting. Did that ever happen? Even in Jericho, the people were commanded uh, to destroy the city and kill the inhabitants, but all the spoils were to be dedicated to the temple, not destroyed. Very interesting uh, historical note. Okay. Uh, before we have the, the commandment uh, concerning the kosher animals, a very interesting verse here. It says, You are children to God. Uh, don't cut yourselves and don't put a bald spot between your eyes. Uh, over a dead person. Uh, in the olden days, uh, part of uh, the idolaters, the way they would uh, they would act in times of mourning was they would physically cut themselves, you know, cutting and make themselves bleed, and they would shave themselves bald right here. This is called between the eyes. In biblical, between the eyes, some people think it's literally over here. No, it's it's the part of the head over here where the hair where the hairline starts. That's also where we are bidden to lay our tefillin, 
uh, every day. And it also means that you can't shave that because that's what they would do. What does it mean you're God's children? We are God's children, so we cannot physically maim ourselves like they would do. Uh, just a Jewish person shows that he is holy. Ki am kadosh Hashem al kecha. You are holy, and therefore you cannot do like everybody else does. Uh, he chose us, it says. He chose you to be a treasured people to him. That's also why we can't eat detestable things. We have to be different in the way that we, uh, in the way that we appear, in the way that we eat, the way that we dress, the way that we behave ourselves is the way that we show our loyalty to God, the way we act like his children, uh, the way we show our holiness. Uh, See, so you said a holy person, you could tell by what he prohibits to himself and how he sticks to those prohibitions. Uh, that's all we have for today, uh, all the time. No, the parasha goes on. We'll discuss more, uh, God willing, Sunday. Uh, thank you for the likes. Please share your questions and your comments. Um, and share the video, like the video with your friends. No, like the video, share it with your friends, uh, like the webpage. And uh, if you have a topic you'd like us to discuss next time, please send it to me. And have a Shabbat Shalom.